All right, so anytime you need a, um, it, a stop for clarification or, or questions, just make sure you, you say that. Otherwise, I will just keep proceeding with the tutorials. Okay, we are in the third tutorial now, 1.3. Let me quit some of the earlier tutorials here. Okay, so this tutorial is about Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, in particular, non-zero Dirichlet boundary conditions. We're going to explain all of this in, uh, using the simple Poisson problem again, but keep in mind that exactly the same procedure applies for, for pretty much any boundary value problem. You have, instead of the Dirichlet boundary, Dirichlet boundary condition, you have essential boundary conditions in other problems, and they are treated exactly the same way. So this tutorial will, will tell you how to do Dirichlet boundary conditions, how, what's happening inside. Okay. Okay. So in, uh, in NGSolve, Dirich these Dirichlet boundary conditions are handled as follows. You have a non-homogeneous, non-zero boundary condition on the boundary that's extended into the domain through an extension that we'll, we'll see how to perform this extension. And that extension then gives you a volume source term, thus reducing the problem of the non-zero Dirichlet boundary condition to the zero Dirichlet boundary condition case. All right, so first the setup with the graphical user interface, everything in imported from NGSolve including uh, from the geometry, the unit square. So first, uh, uh, this is something useful. Once you make a mesh, in this case, the mesh of the unit square, uh, you can ask the mesh for various things. And one thing you can ask if you want, especially if you want to set boundary conditions, is what are the boundaries? There are names given to the boundaries. Okay, in particular, in the, in the case of the unit square, the names are bottom, right, top, and left. Okay, so it's just, uh, this is, Top, no, no, this is not top, this is bottom, right? This is left and, uh, uh, and so forth. So it's, the, the naming is obvious. The, the unit square, uh, well, okay, so uh, th that's our domain and we're gonna impose boundary conditions on the left and on the right, on these two pieces, okay? And if we say that by calling the finite element space, the Lagrange finite element space H1 and providing it a flag Dirichlet equals left or right. You have to read this as a regular expression. The vertical bar is an R. In fact, you can put any regular expression you like here. You could say dot star, and that means put boundary, Dirichlet boundary condition on everything, on all possible uh, boundary names. All right. Okay, so. So when you prescribe Dirichlet boundary conditions on two edges, the, the, the degrees of freedom of the finite element on those two edges are essentially taken. They are constrained by the boundary condition. They should not participate in the solve, in the compute for the solution. So those should be constrained nodes, and then there are something that's, there's some things that are left over, which we, which we call free, do, free degrees of freedom. And this classification is important. But first, let's, let's look at what happens if, if I did not put this. So if, if I did not put the Dirichlet flag, and you print out the total number of degrees of freedom, this is end of is the total number of degrees of freedom uh, of, of a finite element space. If contrary to our expectations, you see that this finite element space and this finite element space have the same number of degrees of freedom. Okay, so. How does NGSolve deal with this constrained and unconstrained degrees of freedom? Uh, it's, when you have this Dirichlet flag, the unknowns are split into two groups, one consisting of the Dirichlet degrees of freedom, DOFs are degrees of freedom, which are constrained. Degree, Dirichlet degrees of freedom are constrained, right? They have, they have their values. And the free degrees of freedom. So even though this number came out to be the same, the way the Dirichlet boundary condition is handled is through these, these bit arrays called free DOFs. Free DOFs is true if and only if, if, and only if the DOF 
is a, is a free degree of freedom. And to see that, you can print out free DOFs. You can ask a finite element space for free DOFs. You see, we, as, we are asking both the finite element spaces for, for free DOFs. And you see free DOFs getting printed. Now, this print, let me just widen the window here a little bit. You see, th this print is, is, is a printing of a bit array. It's got 50 bits, and after that, it goes to the next line. So that's, this is from 0 to 49, and this is from 50 to 99, and, and so forth, right? It's, it's, it's one vector, but it's just printed as, as 50 characters at once. In FS2, which did not have any Dirichlet degree of freedom, uh, we, we did not have any Dirichlet flag, you see that the free DOFs are all one, which means every, every degree of freedom is participating in the solution process. Whereas in the, previ in the previous one, with the Dirichlet flag turned on, you see that not all of them are one. There are some nodes which are zero, and those are the nodes where the Dirichlet boundary condition is imposed. This is how the, the internal mechanism for, for dealing with Dirichlet boundary conditions uh, is implemented in NGSOL. All right. Okay, so now coming to the extension of the boundary data. So I mentioned that this is how we solve a Dirichlet boundary value problem. You're given a G on a part of the boundary, in our case the left and the right, and we have to extend it inside. This extension is we're going to give it a name. It's called u sub d. And the solution is being split as u0 plus u sub d. And then plugging into the variational formulation, you, f you find that in order to compute the, the part with the zero boundary condition, you have to solve this problem. And in this problem, you have a load vector, which is, which is coming from the extension. So how do we do the extension? And how do, we, how do we make this load? If we know these two, then we know how to solve this problem. OK, that's, that's what we're doing here in this example with a particular case of g equals sine y on left and right. So on the, on the left and right boundaries, on these two boundaries, it's a sine of y. Okay. So we declare this function, sine of y. And then we, this is how we do the extension. Okay. Now you see the extension. What has happened is the values of sine y are fixed here on all the, degre all, all the degrees of freedom here. And all in all the triangles inside, one strip away, you have zeros. And to do that, you use the same function that you saw before, the interpolation function set, except you give it an argument that says that you should only interpolate on the boundary. Everywhere else, on the inside, you should, you should have zero degrees of freedom. So all the nodes on the inside are zero, all the nodes on the, on the boundary have been interpolated from sine of y. All right, so. Now we have the extension. We need to assemble. Here's how we assemble. We have the same grad, grad form that we've been seeing before. OK, so what happens in the background? You have this u0 plus ud. You have to compute the, the u0, and the ud has to be sent to the right-hand side. So this thing, this is the equation that needs to be solved. Okay, so for that, NGSolve provides parts of, of these matrices, and let me let's look at the code. If, solve it with some uh, with some right hand side here. This right hand side is one. This is how you make the 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 additional load vector. You take the matrix that you assembled and multiply it with this vector, which is is the vector that you see here, the extension. So at this point, GFU contains the extension. So by multiplying A with this, you're making this vector, and then subtracting it from the source. And after that, all that it remains to be done is the inverse. Okay. You can sort of see the, the signs here on both sides. That's the solution. Now, you can read through uh, this, the matrix uh, block factors, block splitting of those matrices at your own time, if you like. But some of you may not like to do any of this and not think about what is the block splitting and so forth. And then there is, a, there is an automatic way to do all of this using one command, and that's this command called, called BVP. This is a utility function. All you have to do is to set up a bilinear form, set up the boundary condition in this, um, put a preconditioner 
uh, these are some default preconditioners. We'll see more about them later. And then ask the, the, the utility to solve the problem. And the solution will be returned in the same vector in which you provided the boundary condition. Okay, so you can, if you just want a utility without knowing what happens behind the scenes, you do the BVP, and then it does some iterations of the conjugate gradient with the preconditioner, and it solves it. And you didn't see any changes here because it, it plotted again exactly the same solution. Okay. Any issues? Questions? Uh, sorry? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's see. Is it always CG? Uh, your your has his, uh, I don't. Did you hear the question? Is it always? Oh. <laughs> Is the solvers.bvp always doing conjugate gradients? Okay. At the moment. Okay. So at this point, the inverse equals um fact is being used only in a conjugate gradient as a preconditioner? Okay. Okay, well, if. Should I look at the to the source code? No. Okay. Okay. You you can always look at the source code. That's the point of open source, and then you, you'll see exactly what's being what's being done. All right. Uh, I am running a little bit behind. So, any other questions? Okay. In that case.